Welcome to Sunday Night Prime, and we're delighted that you joined us. And uh, you going as you know now, if you want to send us some questions, Sunday Night Prime at ewtn.com. And very shortly in May, we're going to have a whole broadcast just with questions and. Father Lynch will be on. So start sending things in to me now. I'm here today with one of my very, very good friends who, to whom I have great esteem, uh, Father Joseph Fessio. Welcome, Father Joseph. Thank you, Father Benedict. And uh, you all, of course, know Father Joe Fessio. He's a Jesuit of the uh, California province, but many, many other things. Uh, tell us a little bit. What do you do for a living? Well, for a living, I celebrate Mass every morning <laughs> without pay. Without pay. But I am the editor of Ignatius Press. That's my main activity. Uh, we publish Catholic books, religious books, many of them in the EW10 catalog. And uh, we do some videos and uh, sell DVDs. And Did music. you start Ignatius Press? I did start yeah, Ignatius Press, 1978, when you were a young man. Yes. And so was I. Oh, yes. And I went to visit you there when it was just getting started. That's right. Yes. We moved out of those offices two years ago into a firehouse. Oh, my. Yes. Well, Ignatius Press has done tremendous goodness, good for the Catholic Church, not only in this country, but in the entire English-speaking world. Great books. And the one that we want to look at particularly today is Joseph Ratzinger, Benedict XVI, the second edition, or the second volume Part, yeah. of his uh, Jesus of Nazareth. What a marvelous. I've been reading it and just enjoying it immensely. We should also look at this companion volume here, Father Benedict, uh, which you'll see is I Am With You Always, which is a history of devotion to Jesus of Nazareth, yes. written by Father Benedict Grishel, also published by Ignatius Press. But the two make a good companion set, because this is the Holy Father speaking about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and here we have the whole history of devotion to Jesus after. Well, in fact, this book was a response to what the Holy Father himself personally said, that, we, that he was critical of some scholars undermining the divinity of Christ. And he went really after them, and he said that we study the divinity of Christ. And so in response to that, uh, I wrote this book, which is really a history of devotion to Christ from the time of St. Paul right up to the present day, and including not just Catholics, but also Orthodox mm -hmm. and, and, and Protestants. And I've been so pleased that Orthodox and Protestant writers have written to me, evangelical Protestants, mm -hmm. because <laughs> when it comes to devotion, we all agree. Yeah, some theologically we don't, but they all. Oh. And, and unfortunately, uh, devotion kind of died out there for a while. Everybody was talking about Jesus mm. and not praying to him. So One of the strengths of this book by the Holy Father is that uh, he specifically says he's writing it so that we can have a personal encounter with Jesus yes. and have a certitude in our faith. But he's aware of all the scholarship and he uses it when it will help, but he also is critical of it when it gets excessive. Yes. So he is trying to show you can have devotion 
and still have a scholarly understanding, a, a, a elevated understanding of Jesus. Unfortunately, I'm sure you could comment on this, Father. In the 70s and 80s, in the world of scripture scholarship, there was a effect, particularly of Protestant theologians, Boltzmann and others, there was an, uh, a kind of erosion of, of, of the belief in Christ. And even Catholics asking the question, did Jesus know who he was? Right. For heaven's sake. Well, there was this so-called search for the historical Jesus. Yes. What do we really know about him from the point of view of historical scholarship? And of course, Jesus became smaller and smaller and smaller. And then he reflected the personality and the, pers and the views of the person searching for him. He was either a revolutionary, for those who want right. to make him that, or he was a social reformer, or he was an eschatological preacher. But the live flesh and blood Jesus of the Gospels disappeared. And he specifically says in this, that Jesus, which they allegedly found, uh, will not impress anybody, no. nor will anyone follow him. No. But he's trying to use the legitimate findings of scholarship and show that they do not detract from, but they can help our devotion to Jesus. But devotion is from the heart. You know, it, it, the people can be convinced, can, can be enthusiastic, but they have to speak. They have to pray to Christ. That's true, but I want to compliment the kind capuchin here, the, the uh, order of the reformers there, with the Jesuit mind that we have to have truth uh, yes, in our devotion course, too. Course. We can't just have feeling. No, of course. But you know when the Jesuits and the Capuchins were getting started, they got along very, very well. <laughs> they were, uh, they were uh, in the same uh, ballpark. That's right. The Capuchins, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Capuchins were more, uh, less educated. A vast majority of the Capuchins were lay brothers, about three quarters mm. of the brothers. And many of them canonized saints. Uh, uh, the first Capuchin saint couldn't read or write, Saint Felix of Cantalese. Really? But what a sharp cookie he was walking around the city of Rome. And, uh, mm. and right at the same time as the early Jesuits in, in... Well, Ignatius was no scholar. He went back to school when he was an old man to learn Latin. Is that and, a fact? Oh, yes, after his conversion. Isn't that interesting? But he produced a lot of scholars. Yes, so he certainly did. And, uh, and thanks be to God. And I must say, I have, for the last few, couple of decades, disappointed in some of the Jesuit universities, <laughs> putting that right nicely. However, da -da, things are getting better. I was at the funeral of Cardinal O'Connor, and three young men in black cassocks and white surplices, very clean cut, looking men, they came up and they had a kind of funny little smile. And they said, uh, Father, you might be interested to know that we're Jesuit scholastics. So I said, oh, that's wonderful. Tell me, what kind of Jesuits are you? <laughs> so one said, New England. I said, forget New England. Are you a real Jesuit or a phony Jesuit? Because we don't need any more phony Jesuits or any more Franciscans. Phony Franciscans. And, uh, well, they were fine young men. And they, they really, uh, uh, we spoke to them. And uh, I think two of them belong to the New Orleans province. And, uh, but uh, things are moving in the right direction. Well, you and I lived through the dry years, oh, oh. 70s and 80s uh. especially. Honestly, uh, I see real growth, uh, real hope, uh, both for the church in general and for the Jesuit order these days. Yes. Uh, and of course, John Paul II was a big factor there. And I think Benedict XVI uh, is also a tremendous influence for the good of the church. Well, having met, I had a half an hour talk with Benedict XVI when he was a cardinal mm -hmm. in New York. It was a great honor, two of us. He was there speaking at something. And, and we sat there and talked. And I have to say, 
a braid and three quarters. Not a braid and a half, but a, and but what also gentle and a kind, gentleman, and very and and uh, humble. You know, he was a very brilliant cardinal, mm. and uh, uh, he was very, uh, very easy to talk to. Well, I had the great blessing of being his student back in the '70s uh -huh. for my doctoral studies. And all of his students revered him, admired his intellect, but his person as well. And when he was made Pope in 2005, we rejoiced, not just because we could say, you know, our teacher is now Pope, but because we knew that the world would find out what kind of person he really was. You know, he had the image of being the enforcer, the Panzer Cardinal. Yeah. Uh, and within a week, the journalists were saying, well, he's changed, hasn't he? <laughs> I said, no, no. But now you know what he's really like. Really like, you know? yes. And, and, uh, and of course, he, being Pope, he can still write books. I mean, that, that's an amazing thing, that, that he could keep up that intellectual activity. It's also very fascinating that the books are not reading uh, in the form of pontifical. No. Uh, you no, know, no. A, a Pope Pius and others, right. they were rather formal Latin books, mm -hmm. articles. Mm -hmm or encyclicals, and uh, you, know, you know that you're reading it from the ba balcony. This is not well, that at all. Let me say something about some of the characteristics, not just the content, but uh, I've been so impressed by this book and his other books, I've been rereading them, and we're actually going to start an online college credit series of courses oh, based my. on these books. Is that uh, so? St. Thomas More College Online. Uh, it'll, it, we're going to have uh, eventually a full undergraduate uh, degree for a Catholic university, fully accredited online for students who can't afford to go to a, a campus. But I'm going to do four courses in theology, three of which will take books by the Holy Father. We're going to take his two books on Jesus, his book on the liturgy, and then his book on introduction to Christianity, which is a wonderful introduction to the faith. But I've been rereading these books now the last few weeks. And I've noticed some characteristics. One, he's a wonderful teacher, uh, but he's always uh, asking questions that you have, the hard questions, and then answering them. So question and answer like that. Secondly, when he speaks about Jesus, he says, this is not just a historical figure. He's present now. We need oh, yes, a relation yes, with him uh, yeah. right now. Isn't that That's wonderful beautiful. How, how he does it in that book? Yes. And then also, uh, he's always referring to the Old Testament with great respect for the Jews. Yes. And so you can't understand Jesus unless you put him in the context of the preparation for him, which came through the Jewish people. So that, that's a constant in, in his writing there. Yes. Uh, uh, it's been quite remarkable that, because uh, I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood, Irish-Jewish neighborhood, and uh, uh, that's what we grew up, that's what we do. And we do the Jewish holidays and the Catholic holidays. Right. And uh, I must say that he shows great deference to the Jews. And a couple of rabbis have pointed this out to me. Yes. Yes, they, they like him. Yeah. Well, he says in this book that there's a mission for the Jews. Oh, yes. And in fact, he, he makes a big thing about the destruction of the temple and the end of the temple, uh, in which he says the end of the temple meant that Jews also had to rethink their faith because the temple was so central to Jewish faith. And the Judaism began to be a religion of the Torah, of the law of God's commands to us. For Christians, we realize that Jesus is the new Torah. He's the law. He's the way, the truth, and the life. But he says these two divergent paths of rereading the Old Testament need to be in dialogue with each other. So he's open to dialogue with the Jews. And, and it's very clear in this book that uh, yes, uh, I, I'm so delighted by that, having grown up mm -hmm. in a Jewish neighborhood, a Catholic and Jewish neighborhood. Uh, and uh, this was Jersey City, a great theological center. Well, yeah. you're not from New York. No, across the river. Oh, oh, my goodness. Yes, we. I looked over the shoulder. You're an immigrant. Yes, I looked over the shoulder of the Statue of Liberty out the window of my house. I see. I see. But uh, the, uh, well, Father Joseph, we want to be back in a little break here because I want to more to go into the idea that we've been speaking about 
about Jesus. And I think many of our audience need, need to do this. Not only Catholics, but who are we talking about when we're talking about Jesus? We'll be back in two minutes. Father Joseph, the second volume here of Jesus of Nazareth is a kind of a great work of the Holy Father. It will live on many years after him. And uh, it was an important thing to do because unfortunately uh, the historical Jesus got in the way mm -hmm. of the personal Jesus. And the Holy Father, beautifully, when I was reading the first volume of this and the introduction, I was standing up and shouting, you know, yes. I'm waiting all my life to read this, you know, beautifully. Uh, where do you think we're going to go in the Catholic situation now, Catholic colleges, Catholic universities? Well, that depends on a lot of factors, but... Uh, I think the writings of Pope John Paul II and now Benedict are certainly helping to educate younger people. As you know, we're getting more homeschooling students. We're getting smaller Catholic uh, schools now being started by families. The traditional Catholic schools are becoming more traditional. Yes. Uh, we're getting more vocations to the priesthood and stronger vocations, it seems to me. So I think that's going to have an effect on the college. But the college will be the last to, to change because it's the, the pride of intellect it's very hard to overcome. Isn't that true? I'm sorry to say, uh, the, uh, and one of the things that I have noticed that there is somehow or other, there is a change in the, uh, the, 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 the comic, yeah, the, the, uh, uh, the weather among young adults and even older teenagers. They seem to be more serious you could use the word uh, more orthodox. They, they're taking things more seriously. And sometimes they don't hear this from older people, but they come back on their own. I've been talking to students, some of them at Fordham, some of them at uh, Columbia, uh, and uh, I'm around the edges of things, and I'm just delighted by a growth of a certain seriousness of life. Well, I can say this, Father Benedict, that uh, they're buying more and more books. I mean, Ignatius Press hasn't peaked yet. We keep selling more and more books, almost two million last year. Wow. So people are buying books. Also, uh, I'm sure you've had this, this phenomenon yourself, is that young people who want to get an education can't afford it. Generous Catholic families with large families uh, they can't afford twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars a year uh, for a Catholic college. This is why Ignatius Press is now, as I mentioned earlier, working with St. Thomas More. We're going to have a fully online Catholic college. So at least for the first two years, if not all four, you can have a serious, solid Catholic education, but it's not going to cost very much. And there's a Rome program, there's an Oxford program, there's a Greece program. So we're very excited about that. That's a new and, thing with Ignatius Press. And there's a diploma. And a diploma, oh, yes. a degree, yes. bachelor's degree, yeah. Isn't that way ahead of the time? But also, I'll mention the yellow book, okay? Yes, Father I was Benedict, wondering about that. With a strange name called UCAT. UCAT. But it's got a strange history. Uh, Carlos Schönborn, who was my classmate with Father Ratzinger back in the 70s in, right in Germany, is now the Archbishop Cardinal of Vienna. And he was the one whom Ratzinger put in charge of the Catechism of the Catholic Church back in the early 90s. Uh, which I think is a marvelous oh, yes. work of the 20th century. It's just a marvelous. great compendium of the faith and beautifully done. But about three years ago, some young people came to Carl Schumann in Vienna and said, well, we love the catechism, but, you know, many people our age can't get that D 
deep into it. We need something adapted to us. I said, Carmen Schumann said, why don't you help write it then? So they agreed, and they got 50 young students, kind of older high school, younger college students, and they worked with some priests and some youth ministers. They had two full summer camps with 50 students uh, for the whole summer, and they took the Academy of the Catholic Church, and they abridged it. They uh, put it in question and answer, but with commentary uh, from the catechism. Then they have, they have graphics. They took their own pictures. They uh, have quotes from the saints and from other people on the side. It's really a fascinating book, and the Pope was absolutely enthusiastic. He said, let's make this the official catechism of World Youth Day. And so World Youth Day 2011, every participant will have this catechism Isn't in his pack. Isn't and that on the, the Pope wrote an introduction to it. And he, here's what he says. How, how is this for enthusiasm? The Pope is saying this. Study this catechism. This is my heartfelt desire. Study this catechism with passion and perseverance. Study it in the quiet of your room. Read it with a friend. Form study groups and networks. Share with each other on the internet. You need, you'll love this, Father Benedict, you need to be more deeply rooted in the faith than the generation of your parents. You need to be more deeply rooted in the faith than the generation of your parents. That's Benedict XVI. So we're very happy to be the English language publisher of this. How do we get it ordered? Well, I'm sure you can get it through EWTN, right. category, if not immediately, yes. soon after. But Ignatius.com, on the web, Ignatius.com. Ignatius Don't forget that. Don't forget that, yes. And uh, get it ordered, you cat. But it's, it's really well done. Uh, I'm just impressed by what these young people did with the help of, you know, these youth ministers and priests. But I, I do think this will be uh, the, the central work now for young people in preparation for confirmation, for learning their faith. A sad point here. When I grew up, and maybe even you're a little younger, Not much. We, we grew up with nuns, wonderful nuns. I went to school for 12 years, Sisters of Charity, Dominicans, Josephites. Before, before high school? For grammar school oh, and high kidding. school. And <laughs> wonderful sisters. You know, a couple of them are crowd grouchy, but extraordinarily mm -hmm. fine people. And they were filled with the love of God, the love of the church, the love of the Eucharist. They, they, they taught us to make the Eucharist mm -hmm. the center of all lives. And unfortunately, most of these communities have fallen apart. I'm, but not all. I'm, not all. And interestingly enough, coming back. Yes. Yesterday I was at the Sisters of Life, 90 sisters, mm -hmm. our own community, our own sisters, 40 sisters, all in the habit. And uh, I think a habit is an essential, is part of, anthropologically, part of the, our religion. Well, look at the National Dominicans, the oh, Ann Arbor oh, Dominicans. My good friends. Uh, they're flourishing. Yes. Why? Because, not just because they have habits, but that's the outward sign of a fidelity to the church, church. and to tradition, yeah. And they, those both communities yeah. of Dominican sisters yeah. are exemplary. Let's see, and I saw some smaller communities that have, uh, uh, made up the Salesian sisters that you run into here or there, uh, other small community. Let's, oh, well, California, my Carmel good friends. Carmelites is a, a Sacred Heart a, uh, example. Uh, the, uh, the Sacred Heart Retreat House. Yes. Oh, those very, very good sisters. And then the wonderful sisters in uh, in, the, in Nebraska of Alparais and New oh, Lincoln. Oh, yes. I mean, they already have uh, had to do two, uh, another foundation. Yeah. They have huge numbers of vocations. Yes. And let's pray that this is going to spread. But in the meantime, this kind of book, New Cat, puts in what we would, we would have been getting from Sister. But let's not forget, while we're on the topic of good nuns, to remember our dear friend and Franciscan nun, Mother Mary Claire. Oh, yes, yes. Of Roswell, New Mexico, died yeah. two years ago. Yes. Uh, what an incredible person she was, and what a convent. 
You've been to Roswell, I presume? Yes. yes. Oh, yes. I mean, there's nothing in Roswell except UFOs. <laughs> that one, that's reported. But there's this convent, Our Lady Guadalupe convent, 30 nuns in it, but they've had five foundations in the yeah, last 25 yeah. years. I mean, Incredible. New foundations. Yes. Yeah, and, was, of course, you and I have a mutual friend, Ann Miller. Oh, yes. Uh, Sister oh, Mary funny. Joseph. Let's see. A little yes, we, Father Benedict and I met. That's right. Because Ann Miller, a mother of 11 children, who, when her youngest child finally went to college and her husband had died, entered the Carmelite nuns yes. in Des Plaines, Des Plaines uh, Illinois, yeah, or Chicago. Know. As a matter of fact, I came out on the plane with her and Father oh, that's right. uh, Regis, that, yeah. and we brought her to the convent door, and St. Teresa said, only your mother can bring you to the door. So Father Regis and I had to stand on the sidewalk oh. and wave goodbye. <laughs> and, She's still rice, doesn't she? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. flourishing, uh, flowery letters and uh, yes, lots uh, of them, yeah. Lots of them. Yeah. But I think Father Cardinal Newman used a, a special way, phrase, a second spring. Yes. Are we beginning to see a second spring? I'm, I am coming in for a landing here fairly soon, and I'm looking forward to purgatory. I'm from Jersey City, and I just like purgatory. Yeah. But uh, the... Uh, I, 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 I think when I'm saying goodbye, things are much better than they would have been in 1980. They are, but I also think Bill Benedict has a more realistic view of the near-term future and mid-term future of the church than Pope John Paul II did. Paul, John Paul II was a great enthusiast, and yeah. he would encourage people, but I think things were painted a little rosier than, than maybe they're going to become, whereas he speaks about what he calls creative minorities, that uh, faithful Christians, faithful Catholics will be part of communities which will be 11 in the world, but he does not expect to see a transformation of culture uh, anytime soon. It may happen, but uh, we definitely are seeing, though, a renewal yes. in, in, the, in, and John in the United Paul States. And John Paul started the, the ball rolling. He did. In fact, John XXIII uh, gave it the push in the right direction. Right, with the we have been, I'd like to hear this, Father Joseph, we have lived in our lives in the times of great popes. Great we popes. Have. The beginning 20th with century. Pius XII. Well, the 20th, well, beginning with Pius X, or yes. even later the 13th. I mean, uh, I think that the 20th and late 19th century we've seen a succession of extraordinary popes. popes. We've been very blessed. And you think, we don't think of them much. Pius XI stood against the worst people yes. in, in modern history. Hitler, Mussolini, and, and he just stood right up to them. And I still like his mode of expression better than what came after him. I mean, Casti Canubi about marriage is still yeah. worth reading. Yes, uh, yes. But he doesn't mince words. No. Uh, <laughs> I have no intention yes. of changing my... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I no. <laughs> and Pius the Twelfth, almost a mystic, and faced with that horrible thing on out there in the stage of history, yeah. with Hitler, um, Stalin, and he stood his he stood his place. He did. When I was a boy, Pius the Twelfth died, and. Uh, I remember at the time of his death, there was a, uh, everybody spoke about Pius XII. Mm. He was very well respected. You know, speaking of the role popes have had, another book we're coming out with, we just signed a contract with Newt and Callista Gingrich. Uh, Newt's a convert to the Catholic Church. Yes. Uh, they did a video on nine days that changed the world, which is John Paul II's trip to Poland and how that yes. changed history. Yes. And now they're writing a book about it, which yeah. we'll publish probably early in the spring of 2012. But again, what one man can do in one trip of a few days to a country, I mean, he and Reagan, I think, and Thatcher were the three key persons who brought down the evil empire. Yes. And you know, that's, he was, and I think they have said that the Pope had been a very important part of the whole thing. 
Oh, no question about no it. No question about well, that, it. That trip to Poland was a catalyst. Yes. You know, and but uh, it was the devotion of the Polish people through the hard times, which was kept by other good Polish priests and Polish bishops, uh, oh, yeah. Wyszynski especially. They're the ones that really held the faith, and so when John Paul II came, could ignite it. Uh, well, I told you I grew up in Jersey City. And you one told thing me that. you, you keep up, telling me that, yes. You, know, why, you should be ashamed of that. What, what, what you learn when you're growing up in Jersey City is the Poles don't move. The, our Lady of Chenstohova and, uh, oh no, yeah. uh, you knew exactly where we're going with the Poles. And, uh, I grew up with lots of Jewish people and Polish people, and uh, I appreciated both of those. It's groups. Italians too. Oh, lots. And lots. Irish. With a Jewish Jersey City, <laughs> I, despite my name, uh, my, my family is Irish. We have a little break here now, so we'll be right back. And I'm sure you're not being bored. We'll be right back. Father Joseph, what are we going to tell about now? Well, I've been saving this for the last segment, uh -huh. Father Benedict, because it's the most exciting thing of all. Watch out for Jesuits, you know. Uh, your favorite newspaper has put this book on its bestseller list now for the last three weeks. This one? Oh, this one. This one. Yes. Yeah. So this has been a New York Times bestseller, up to number five. And it's not finished yet. So we're happy as a publisher that people are buying the book. Yes. We're happy the New York Times is helping us to sell yes, a course. book on Jesus Christ by the Pope. Uh, but the, the best part of all is that uh, the message is getting out. And Pope Benedict says at the beginning of the book, he's got a single purpose in this book, is to present the message and the person of Jesus the message and the person of Jesus. That's what the book is about. But in the next paragraph, he says, why am I doing that? He says, because I want people to see Jesus in such a way that they can have a personal encounter with him and know that their faith stands on solid ground. So that's his whole purpose in the book. So if the New York Times will help us sell that book, sure, I'm all for it. If someone would read the book, I'd like it even more. <laughs> well, you know, there are good days on, in the Times. There are good articles. My neighbors read it for me because I won't buy one. <laughs> and they cut out interesting articles. I see. And it's a mixed bag, you know, the writers and things like that. It has a consistent uh, prejudice against the Catholic Church. I would think it has a consistent prejudice against religion, uh, but uh, and they try to show cover that up, but they're not kidding me. Well, you know, when uh, the Pope came out with his surprise book in November of 2010, Light of the World, uh, there was one small section in that where he mentioned condom use in Africa and how there may be circumstances where it, it could be uh, not a moral good, but could be understood why it might be used to prevent disease and so on. And of course, that was the one paragraph in the whole book that was in the papers for, for months. Weeks. But uh, Lori Goodstein, who writes for the New York Times here, and Rachel Donadio, who is a Rome correspondent, contacted me because we're the publishers of that book. And by the way, it's another wonderful book by this Holy Father. I mean, what Holy Father would expose himself to one hour a day for six days to a journalist to answer any question that holds barred? But this Pope did that. But I want to say this about the New York Times. Even though the coverage, I still think, was slanted, uh, they made a sincere effort. We talked for for long periods of time, 
I said I had to explain to them uh, what the Pope actually said, what he meant, what he didn't say, and what the church's teaching is. And you know, even with the best of will, there's a kind of blindness there. But I, I honestly think they made an effort, and it, it could have been worse if they hadn't been willing to listen. So I do think they're professional, and to the extent that we can help educate them uh, in the faith, uh, we're doing a good service because that's needed. But by the way, on that, that book, uh, I actually thought that this book, Light of the World, would be more popular than Jesus of Nazareth because uh, this is pretty deep. It's readable. I think anybody who's well-educated, you know, normally can read this book and profit from it. Uh, but Light of the World is an interview where the Pope is yes. answering questions about everything, about the church, about the world, about the abuse scandal, about bishops, about priests, you name it, about his personal life, about his prayer, what he watches for television, uh, does he play the piano, uh, but this book is actually already more popular than that Light of the World book. Of the world. Well, uh, I must say that, uh, you know, when I'm critical of the times, which I am, because I was very disappointed. For 50 years, I read the New York Times. I grew up with it. Uh, and uh, as a young priest, uh, we always read the Times. That's what you read. You read the Times. Yeah. But in recent years, they became noticeably, subtly, but after a while not too subtly, anti-Catholic and anti-religious. Uh, and uh, there were articles that were not, but uh, right in the middle of something, I don't know what was going on, front page, center, with a color picture of the New York Times about a priest in a scandal out in the Midwest quite some time ago. What is it doing in the middle? Right. I mean, this is not news. It's history. And uh, the, uh, you would also have the impression that the only people who ever get into trouble are Catholic priests. You know. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, you know, it's a... uh, one rabbi, no, it was a minister, uh, told me, he says, look, we, we had a, a scandal. It made page 44 of the Newsday. It didn't yes. even make the, the, the New York Times. So they're, they're purposely shooting at the Catholic Church. And they have their reasons. We're opposed to abortion. We're both to eat euthanasia. You know, we're... Homosexual uh, um, unions uh, yes, and activity. You know, and uh, that, that's part of the whole situation. And uh, so uh, that's where we're there. Well, that, you know, uh, that's something which becomes clear in the book of the Holy Father, both volume one and volume two, uh, is that he doesn't come as a powerful messiah who's going to try and have a liberation in the political order. Uh, and it, in this book at the very beginning, he talks about how Jesus comes into Jerusalem on a donkey. And it's true the donkey was a sign of the Messiah, but the Pope goes back to Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9, I think it is, where that's prophesied, prophesied and, and shows that uh, the, the king, the Messiah that was going to come on the donkey in Zechariah was a king who did away with war, a king of peace, and one who was humble. And by the time of Jesus, the Pope brings out, the donkey was no longer a symbol of royal authority. The horse was. So that even in the very beginning of this book, the Pope is showing that the way of Jesus is not the way of violence, it's not the way of power, it's the way of submission. But when Jesus taught the way he did, saying the hard sayings, no divorce, no adultery, uh, he aroused resistance. People turned against him. And he did not fight back. He did not resist in a violent way. He accepted it. And I think that's the case in the church today. 
I mean, we're going to have people who accept abortion, who accept homosexual unions, resisting the church and being hostile to it and trying to criticize it and trying to find fault with it. And, of course, there's fault because people like you and me are part of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the, uh, the, the response of Jesus is the response of accepting that in love and loving one's enemies and suffering. Uh, by the way, this beautiful passage here, which, which the press did pick up on, because, you know, the Catholic Church has been criticized by the New York Times and others as being responsible for anti-Semitism in history. And there's some truth to that. Well, uh, but fundamentally, it's not true. And one of the texts which has been used to show the Catholic Church is anti-Semitic is in Matthew's Gospel, uh, where the people say, his blood be upon us and on our descendants, you know. Well, this is the blood curse. The Jewish people are cursed. What does the Pope say about that? This is fa fantastic. He says, first of all, who are Jesus' accusers? Again, he's a great teacher. He always has a question. Who are his accusers? Well, uh, Mark says, excuse me, he starts with John first. John says, just the Jews. But if you read John's gospel, you realize when John says the Jews, he's not referring to the Jewish people. He's referring to the temple aristocracy. So right away, it's not the Jews that are in question. It's the temple aristocracy, which has gone bad. He says, though, that in Mark's gospel, it becomes the crowd. It was the crowd who wanted to crucify Jesus. But who was the crowd? Every year at Passover time, uh, the Romans would give amnesty to one of the prisoners. And so there was a prisoner there who was a, a rebel uh, named Barabbas. And his friends came. They wanted him out. So that crowd was a rabble of the supporters of Barabbas. They didn't even know who Jesus was, most of them, any of them. And so they would give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. So the crowd that really did not want to accept the release of Jesus was not the Jewish people. It was a very particular group who was supporting this rebel. But then the Pope says, however, uh, St. Matthew says, and the whole people shouted out. Well, what does the Pope say? Well, first of all, he says you couldn't get the whole people all there together, could you? So that, he didn't mean that. But uh, he says that Matthew's gospel does not mean, therefore, that the whole Jewish people are responsible. And then the best part, Father Benedict, he takes the passage where the people say his blood be upon us and on our children. And the Pope says, that's not a call for vengeance. The blood of Jesus is not the same as the blood of Abel, who was killed by his brother. It does not call out vengeance. The blood of Jesus has redemptive blood. And we all need redemption. And that call down of the blood on upon us is a kind of prophecy saying this is what we all need. But it is not something which is meant to condemn the Jewish people. So just in a few pages, he takes that very controversial issue uh, in a very scholarly way, but a way that you can understand and appreciate and dissipates all the clouds. It's really beautiful. The other group of people that we kind of forget, the Galilean women, they, you know, they don't get much of a voice, but they're stood by the cross of Jesus. Oh, at the cross, but not at the trial, at the cross, no, yes. But the, the, the women who have come up from Galilee, and they were on his side when we celebrate That's the... Right. the Stations of the Cross, the holy women of Jerusalem, and they were women from Galilee. And the Pope brings that out, too. He says that uh, th there's two kinds of, uh, of accounts of the resurrection. There's the confessional kind and there's a narrative kind. Uh, and the confessional kind were, were short statements made by men to testify that Jesus had risen. Because in the Jewish tradition of the time, a woman couldn't testify. Her testimony wasn't counted as, as valuable. But in the other accounts, the narrative account, is the women. And so there's already a transition there in the Gospels to recognize the value of women. Oh, yeah. By giving that. The three women and then, of course, Mary Magdalene. Yes. Our old friend. Good old Mary. 
Yes. I, I think she's one of the favorite people I read about in the New Testament, Mary Magdalene. Right, and that scene uh, is so beautiful, you know. Uh, uh, she, uh, he, she thinks he's the gardener. Yeah, you know? it's marvelous. And of course, it's Chester who says he, he is the gardener. You know, yeah, she, yeah. she wasn't wrong about that because God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden in the evening of the day. And now God again is in the garden in the morning of the day. And, his, and she ran to the apostles? Yes. Yeah, that's a marvelous scene. Of course, in Paris, there is that she didn't marvelous run in Paris. church. Oh, go ahead. That marvelous church, Madeleine. The, the Madeleine, built, yes. Built by Napoleon. I think it's the most beautiful church in the world. No, no, you sorry. Know? Notre Dame is better than more beautiful. Well, it's a different style, yeah. yes. I would say Notre Dame is a beautiful church. The Madeleine is a beautiful building. It's, okay, I'll give you that. It's not a church building, yeah. no. Uh, the, uh, well, uh, we're getting there, Father Joseph. Now, uh, we're... I'm going to ask you a tough question. The two of us are getting old. Uh, yes. You have noticed. And I've known you for 30 or 40 years. Where are we going? When we're getting Where are you and I going? Well, I know I'm going to purgatory. Hope, yes, yeah. I'm going to purgatory, of course. But uh, where is where's the church? Where is the country? Where is the world? <laughs> uh, is it hopeful? A hopeful time. Well, yeah. let me tell you some reasons for hope that I have. I may get in trouble for this because this is going to be broadcast, but we're both old enough now that it doesn't do much damage no, if we get in trouble, does it? No. There's not much time left. Uh, no matter how great a pope is, uh, no pope can run the church. I mean, basically, where do people contact the church? Their parish priest, you know, sometimes a bishop. Uh, but if you don't have priests who are good and striving for holiness, then any renewal of the church, I think, is you know, going to be difficult. So what's happening now? Uh, first of all, we're getting young men who are better educated. I love the homeschool family kids. I mean, they are just extraordinary young people. Uh, and more Catholic couples are having large families because you can't have vocation without large families. You have some but it's basically the large Catholic family which is the source of vocation. So that's happening. But there's been a key element missing. Seminaries are critical in the formation of priests. And when you have bishops who are uncertain about the faith or afraid to proclaim the faith in a, in a strong and manly way, then you've got seminaries who do not get, which do not give proper formation. We had a whole generation of bishops, I call them the Jadot bishops, the profile was we want reconcilers, meaning we want someone who's never stood up and taken some shots, you know. So they wanted nice people. Nice. Yeah. Nice, yeah. Nishire. And But these people were not capable of meeting the crisis after the council with the confusion and the sexual revolution. And so in our seminaries, we had a rejection of Humanae Vitae, a rejection of the church's moral teaching on all sexual issues, we had dissent. We had students allowed to enter the seminary who were not really qualified or had affective disorders, as they call them euphemistically. And bishops were not strong enough to correct that. I, I, I lived through that. I saw that again and again. What's happening now? I mean, we are getting more and more good bishops being appointed in the United States. Yes, yes. And around the world, too, but I know here. In this country. California... I mean, we've just had a string of good appointments. Uh, we hope this thing continues because some retirement's coming up this year. But, okay, so that's good. But here's something even better. Uh, I have had the privilege of knowing important people like you and like the Pope and like Cardinal Schoenborn. But there's another one, a friend of mine, a priest named Father Mark Ouellette. He was a Sulpician priest. Uh, he was a re seminary rector in uh, South America for many years, and he taught up in Canada. He's Canadian, French-Canadian. Anyway, Father Will and I have known for years as a wonderful priest, very intelligent. He did his doctorate on Hans von Balthasar, as I did mine. Uh, very personable. 
And he was made bishop years ago, and then he was made Archbishop and Cardinal of Quebec. Well, last summer, the Pope appointed him as prefect of the congregation for bishops. That means he is the one in charge of the congregation that makes the appointments. And one of the key members of that congregation is Cardinal Burke. Yes. From St. Formers from St. Louis. And Cardinal Burke is just outstanding. Yeah, I mean, mild, gentle, but a great scholar and absolutely un, uh, unafraid to speak the truth, you know, wherever he's, he's called to do so. So I, I see that we're going to have a continuing succession of bishops who are strong in the faith and who believe in formation of the priests who will help the seminaries improve even more. And therefore, Father Benedict, I, although I have my, I'm a card-carrying cynic, okay, uh, and I've, I've been through a lot of, you know, talk about how things are getting better, but I really think that, that uh, we are in a period where the Pope can do more because he's going to have better bishops supporting and better priests supporting the bishops. And EWTN is a big factor in this, yes. spreading that word. I believe Ignatius Press is doing that too. Uh, we're trying to make the work of this, this Pope and the previous Pope and those whom they so admired, like von Balthasar and Dudubach, uh, more uh, disseminated in the world. And I, I've been teaching for 46 years at Dunwoody. 46 years. A great seminary. Solid. It and is. It remained will. great even through the times uh, of right. trial. And we have a great archbishop, uh, Tim Dolan, a, a man among men. And uh, we are very, very grateful. You're Father blessed. Joseph, thank you for being us. O Lord, be with us all and help us, each of us, to live up to the faith and to the service of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And please keep us going here at EWTN. Don't forget Mother Angelica had said your things in to keep us going. And because we have to keep the, the machines going and the electricity coming on. God bless. Thank you.